Welcome to the XY Advisor Podcast, where it's our goal to help you become the best financial advisor possible and drive the positive evolution of financial advice. Hub24 is an ASX-listed company with over $15 billion funds under management and one of the fastest-growing platforms in the market. Neither a bank nor part of a bank, Hub24 focuses entirely on connecting advisors to a broad range of investment solutions for their clients. Discover why other advisors think Hub24 are the best in the market and access the benefits of choice and efficiency for you and your clients with their market-leaning managed portfolio solution. To find out more, visit hub24.com.au. G'day, how's it going? What do you know? Strike Lights, Clayton here, chatting with Chris from uh, Master Your Money Now. Now, where did you get that name from? I love that name. Master really Your Money like Now? Yeah, 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 yeah. I've always liked the con- – the original plan was to do um, Master Your Money, um, but that was taken. So as I was looking through the domain names, one of the suggestions was um, Master Your Money Now. I was kind of like, yeah, I like that actually. It's got a bit of, uh, adds a bit of urgency to it. You know, it's not something we want to do tomorrow, not something that we want to do, uh, you know, next week. It's something we want to master your money right now. So, um, yeah, that's where it came from. Then the reason I like Master Your Money, I always like this concept of, you know, I feel like money masters a lot of people. Um, it, you know, money decide, makes the decisions for so many everyday Australians that, um, yeah, getting that relationship reversed so you become the master of money, that's, um, I think that's ultimately what we do here. I mean, that's really cool. Um, is that the name of your actual practice? Like, yes. In your, that's so cool. Like, yeah. when, when I had my financial planning company, uh, I was a part of the Hillross network, so you mm. have to use the word Hillross. Yeah, and um, and then I can't remember why. I think because I wanted to name my company Silverstone Wealth Design, mm-hmm. and so and uh, it ended up being Hill Ross Silverstone, which yes. sounded super like <laughs> I don't know, way too proper. And and I just love these kind of new names that are out. Like you got mm. Fox and Hair, yes. you got Pivot Wealth, you got Marcy yep. Money Now, like. I love just all these better names that, are, yeah. you know, they're attracting um, a different type of clientele. But, mm. but t- talk to us, like, what is your, um, what's your ideal market and, yeah. and how did you decide what that was? Yeah, so um, I, 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 when I started my own practice um, uh, July 2018, so nearly 18 months ago now, and I really had a passion for uh, wanting to help everyday people, which, um, and particularly, I really wanted to help my mates. That's, that's really what I wanted to do as part of this practice. And so, um, but the term everyday people is quite vague. That was the feedback I was getting. Yes. We just don't know what that is. We don't know, you know, who everyone thinks they're kind of like an everyday person. So, which it wasn't what in my head what I was going for. And so it was kind of like, um, yeah, not really cutting through. So we're going down a bit more Pacific. So specifically teachers and nurses. Um, my parents are teachers. My wife's a nurse. So that's, um, that's kind of how it, uh, that occurred. And most of my mates are te- particularly teachers. Um, and, and nurses, mm-hmm. so um, yeah, and then particularly that twenty-five to thirty-five-year-old demographic. So there, we do a lot of, of work in the saving for their first home, uh, so the first home super saver scheme. That's how we get a lot of clients. Um, how you can buy your first home in the next twelve months, but yep. they're also um, um, yeah, they a lot of them will see their parents are just retiring and they won't be retiring with enough. And their parent, and they're seeing that, they're knowing that Centrelink's not a much, they don't have much in their super, and they're going, I don't want to finish up like that. And that is a real big driver for to my generation and, and yeah, getting, get, realising that, you know, getting their super sorted it, um, and getting those, all the cash flow and insurances sorted now Um you can make a big difference and you can make a big difference. You know, those little things like switching from a balanced or high growth fund to 25, it's far better to do that, you know, rather than coming in at 55 
You know, I remember at the bank, there was one tradie, you know, his back was stuffed, he couldn't work, he's got 50 grand in his super, he's like, I need to retire, what do I do? And the answer is nothing, like, or very little. Um, So, but at least when you're picking up these issues at age 25, um, like I even had a client who's, you know, within like a a retirement savings account, 100% in cash. Like to make that change at 25 rather than 55 is, as you would know, it's life-changing. Huge, yeah. Um, I'm a big fan of this uh, this demographic because um, one, it's 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 a demographic that a lot of advisors shy away from, right? Like it's the it's the classic ha 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 engineer and school teachers are so hard to deal with, right? Yeah, and yeah. you've just gone well, yeah, like send them my way. Yeah, um, oh, not, and- not the engineers, not the engineers. <laughs> I couldn't do the engineers, but. Um- I think, um, and I think it comes down to style and personality. And I think, like, I'm a self-confessed book nerd. You know, I'm very, I'm very book smart, not street smart. That's something I've had to develop, learn the hard way. Um, so, and I think naturally, I give a lot of detail and information. So even I remember, you know, one particular client, the teach, it was a teacher and a graphic designer. The teacher was just lapping up all the details, you know, everything I was going through. But the graphic designer, you just had that look going, this is too much information, I don't get this, you know. So having to adjust that, um, yeah, I think that's a, so a bit of part of that just natural personality. But, yeah, yeah, send the teachers and nurses my way, more than happy to have a chat to them. That's awesome, mate. And, and um so the, the reason I really like it is uh, there's so many people in that position, even if they're not exactly a teacher, but yeah. like I completely understand what you mean when you say everyday people that are like teachers and nurses. And because mm. there's so many of these um, type of people out there, mm. it's oftentimes hard to attract them. So I want to ask you, right? How do you avoid getting just sucked up into the minutiae of everything to everyone? And how do you get your message directly across to this large segment? Good question. So I definitely needed a bit of help. So like I said, I tried using the phrase everyday people, which was something that I did when I launched the business and it wasn't cutting through. So Getting down to, I think, um, and I had a lot of resistance coming into Nietzsche. And I remember that there was an XY advance in Melbourne two years ago. It was Rebecca Pitchard, Craig and Ravi. Um, sorry, yeah. I can't think of their last names off the top of my head. But um, talking about, you know, the importance of Nietzsche. And I was kind of like, no, nah, you don't need a Nietzsche, you know. You know, you know, <laughs> you know yeah, that's going to limit my, yeah, that's going to limit my audience, you know. I don't <laughs> want to do that. And and I, and I still do. Like if a tradesperson, for example, wants to see me for advice, I'm happy to help them. So I'm not exclusive teachers and nurses. 100%. But um, when, when it comes to marketing these days, you have to be niche. Absolutely. And, you know, if you're, you know, you have to be yes, yeah, so niche when it comes to your marketing because everyone else is doing it and that's what's getting the cut through. So to, how do we track that audience? I'm working, um, uh, do a fair bit of marketing through uh, Christian Jacobson, which I'm sure you know, he's a big friend of the XY Advisor Group. And, um, yes. and um, yeah, we're really, we've started with nurses. We're just about to move into teachers and really going down that Facebook, Instagram um, uh, for targeting for the, both the content and also for the, the call to action as well. Not LinkedIn because yeah. teachers and nurses are not linked on LinkedIn. Um, That's a really good point. Yeah. 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 So, um, so for me, LinkedIn is more connected with other advisors or yeah. pretty much. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That kind of thing, particularly yeah. now that I have got the, uh, did get the AFA rising star. So, but yeah, the Facebook, <laughs> that's, but um, the Facebook in particular, um, yeah, you can get so deep. It's scary how much information Facebook knows about you and you can get oh, so man. targeted and just send a message and get that feeling of this message is for me. Yeah. It's not for the mass market. This is for me. Yeah. So, yeah, that's, um, yeah, that's pretty much awesome, it. Awesome, mate. So um, you, you're working on your engine to, mm-hmm. to bring clients in. 
have you have you done much work on uh, let's call it like I don't like using the term sales process, but it's a good terminology. So marketing represents everything uh, you can do to build a relationship with someone before they come into your office. Yeah. And then at that point, if you've done a really good job with marketing, you don't really need a small sales process, but it's the Correct. in-person, you know, just thanks for coming in. Thanks. I'm glad you like all my stuff. Now mm. here's how to become a client. Have you done a little work on that or are you still just working off whatever feels well or feels good, I should say? Let me answer that question a bit of a roundabout way. So I think in, I know when, because prior to starting my own practice, I was um, at ANZ Bank, which absolutely, I did enjoy my time at ANZ, but middle of uh, uh, July 2018, Royal Commission, we got clients coming into you saying, hey, don't take this personally, Chris, I just don't trust you because you work for a bank. It's time yeah. to make a change. That was one of the primary drivers as to starting my own practice. But, um, but for me, I, I've, I've got this term front-end and back-end advisor. And I think front-end yep. advisor is someone who's really good at the marketing, really good at getting clients in, but may struggle with the yep. back-end process of, um, of uh, you know, doing the, the FDSs, the opt-ins, implementation, following up with customers, all that kind of stuff. And then there's the back-office yep. advisor who is, who's good at that side of things but would maybe struggle with the sales and process side of things. I'm 100% a back-end advisor. And so I, I, I identified that pretty early. I feel that, I'm, I feel that I'm good at creating content, but it's the distribution yeah. of that content is probably, I knew it was an area that I needed help in. And so to anchor, to go back to your question, realistically, yeah, what we did was we really go down to, um, yeah, generating the, sh particularly the short, short videos um, or the whiteboard Wednesday and really sending them out to the target audience. So getting the content out first to our target audience. Mm -hmm. And then once we've got that audience, then we bring in the, the pitch, so to speak, booking for a complimentary 30 minute strategy session and yes. then go from there. So, um, yeah, that's, um, yeah, so that's, yeah, so that's something I needed help with. Um, yep. and it's not my strong point, but, um, thank you know, there's other people out there that do that for a living. Fantastic. So, um, yeah, that's, that's how I improve the process. Mate, that's, that's a huge advantage. I was always, um, like, I, uh, yeah, I was definitely that front end advisor. Mm. And so, I feel like if you're a back-end advisor, naturally, you can hire the people that can handle, that can help you with your front-end stuff. But yep. it is, it was a little bit more difficult, uh, or at least I found it difficult to find people who were naturally inclined to handle my back-end. So mm. I could handle the front-end. Uh, my back-end, I, I would hire people and I had staff to handle it. But I always sort of, I was jealous of people who were naturally back-end I feel like outsourcing yeah. that that marketing, um, and so mate, it's it's awesome to hear you do that. So let's say um, you know fifty people fall into a funnel. Let's say ten people make a meeting. Mm. Let's say five, seven, whatever turn up. Yep. Um, and let's say fifty percent of those become clients. Give, give yep. or take. Sure. Um, uh, when they come into your meeting, mm. um, I'm interested as as someone who's naturally a, a back office sort of advisor. Have you worked on a process that says, uh, excellent, you've done X, Y, Z. Now, in order to become a client after, like, after this meeting, um, you, you know, these are the next steps. Do you find that naturally easy to do? Generally, yeah. That's, for me, that's the easier part. And um, so for my process is, yeah, get the 30-minute, and even especially dealing clients remotely as well, there's a couple of things I'll mention. So firstly, so if they're not based in Geelong, and half of my clients, so, I, so, for, so let me take a step back. So for those who don't know, I'm, I'm in Geelong. Um, so half of my clients are in Geelong, and we do them face-to-face. The other half are all around Australia. So um, wow. fair bit, uh, particularly up the eastern coast, everywhere from Rockhampton to Hobart. So um, yeah, and a fair few in cool. Sydney. So um, so the first meeting is usually just a 30-minute phone call and yeah. just uh, pretty much, you know, the usual, you know, this is what we do. Do I like you? Do you like me? That's all, you know. 
And then after that, we'll book them in for a one hour appointments and we'll do that via Zoom. That's where we go through a bit more of the nitty gritty in regards to um, uh, getting, uh, yeah, you know, what do they want, things like that. And then from there, I'll make the, um, the proposal and say, all right, I think you should be on our gold package. That's specifically done for first home buyers. To get started, here's a deposit. Um, do you want to go ahead? They say, yep, fantastic. We'll get all that paperwork uh, s- sorted. So, and in terms of doing it remotely, it's the hardest part for me is the certified ID um, because, yeah. yeah, because I know, I know this varies from licensee to licensee, which is an interesting pickup from uh, the AFA conference, but certainly my licensee focus, their view is that showing your ID up on a computer screen like that would doesn't classify as being witnessed so um uh yeah so they would have to go to um they can go to another nurse um uh or obviously a pharmacy and so forth to get their certified id themselves and then they've just got to yes send that through to me um and then the rest of the documents you know our the infocus crm we can sign a lot of documents online so set uh soas atps just a pin that needs to be sent. And then it's just those annoying documents which just require a physical wet signature because um, some super funds are not uh, up to the 21st century at the moment um, yeah. to, uh, to accept DocuSign and Hello Sign and so forth. So, um, yeah, so I generally find that, again, for me, the certified ID is the only difference on onboarding a client remotely in comparison to uh, doing it on doing it um, face-to-face. At the end of the day, and again, because I wanted to do something that I could be flexible in my location, um, Gen X, you know, that kind of formed my target market as well. So, you know, uh, Gen, you know, Gen X, Gen Y, you know, your friends and family on Facebook, why, is your, why not your financial planner? That makes sense mm. to do those things remotely. Aged care, on the other hand, probably would prefer the face-to-face. Yeah, there's there's a lot more sort of emotional things going on in terms of, of age. Course. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Just a complicated um, area that uh, hats off to anyone who specialises in that. Absolutely, um, but that's a that's a really good insight in in terms of uh, the similarities and the differences of of remote planning. Um, talk to me about how you feel. So you're, you're a rising star, obviously. Um, you know, you, but you're an advisor beforehand. You're out on your own. You're in that sort of that early phase and now we've got all these fascia things coming in. You've got all these mm. sort of additional um, requirements. My, my assumption is as a new ad- uh, or as someone who's just sort of uh, recently launched their own business, you're probably in that overwhelming stage of just getting everything done that, in, that if there's another thing, it's probably not to you the biggest problem in the world because it just is another one of these things that just needs to get done yeah um compared to you know advisor who would say have a business for 20 30 40 years um they're they're going to sort of feel that change whereas someone like you uh is just in that mindset of oh, whatever this needs mm. to get done needs to get done so that's my assumption uh, and yep. i'd love to hear uh your personal opinion on how you yeah found- like yeah, and that's, yeah, I, th- I think you're right. Again, natu- being a back-end and book smart kind of personality type, the study side of things comes um, relatively straightforward. So I've been, I'm doing, I've just uh, finished off my diploma in mortgage broking because I just became a mortgage broker earlier this year. So um, oh, no. that was a nasty 8,500 word assignment at the end, which I uh, don't want to repeat. So um Oh, that was yeah. bad. So, and look, thankfully, um, one of the things that I did was I did a lot of my study before I became an advisor. So I was actually CFP qualified before I started working at ANZ. So, yeah, wow. um, yeah How so uh, because my first, so when I started as a para planner, um, the first role that I got in, big focus on education, which was great. So they got us signed up in the program. And even after, um, uh, I left that practice, just something that I continued on. And so, yeah, if there's, so yeah, I did four years of paraplane before coming an advisor. So, wow. and yeah, so by the time that I did start at ANZ, I was, yeah, had the CFP 
it's virtually all done, just needs some practical experience, uh, which, oh, which wow. is a huge advantage. I'm so glad that I got all that done before, yeah. um, before, um, before I came to advisor because that is a lot of tough work. And even um, uh, we always talk about that, you know, that 55 or 60-year-old demographic where, you know, why would they go back to uni? But even the young advisors, you know, around my age, your age, it's still a big yeah. commitment. We're busy. Oh, yeah, man. It's a oh, big man. Commitment. Like, so, but yeah. at the end of the day, it's got to be done. Um, we yeah, have correct. to be degree qualified going forward. It's, um, yeah. It's I, I, think, I think that's one of the things that's pretty unanimous. I'm always, I'm very much of the opinion that, um, like, uh, you know, especially sort of being a part of XY where the slogan is to drive the positive evolution of financial mm. advice and the whole sort of community is, on, on that journey collectively as to what the hell that means and sort yeah. of adding, you know, from every angle what that means. And I think advisors are pretty resilient and, um, and want to see uh, the positive evolution of financial advice mm-hmm. happen. It, it really just, the only thing that I guess we push back on is the rapid pace of that change. Um, so I, I'm, I'm, everyone's got their own opinion on, on a lot of these things. My opinion was in regards to, uh, let's say, the, um, the, the, the grandfathering, right, the grandfathering mm. commissions. I actually was a big fan of what came out of FOFA in that <clears throat> 1st of July 2013. Mm. Any new investment superannuation products could not have a, uh, a, you know, a commission attached to it. And then that, that automatically meant that there was a rundown of about 20 years where, you know, that, the, the amount of people who were in sort of those kind of products would just slowly, you know, run out. Mm. And everyone was kind of prepared and sort of jumped on to, to say, yes, that, that worked fine. And now all of a sudden that, that is uh, getting ripped out from under them. Now, of course, no one's going to sit there, you know, this day and age and defend commissions, especially new commissions. But um, I, I just, I saw it as it had achieved what, what I guess the regulators wanted to see and then was giving everyone enough time to sort of adapt. With, with all these new sort of fast year uh, education and, and standards and everything like that, again, I'm a fan of it and I like it, but maybe, uh, you know, and I'm glad that it's been extended now. Mm. Um, a couple of these timelines, but I, I, That's I, the, I yep, go on. Feel, I feel like I'm, I'm all for all this positive stuff. Just don't stretch people to break and uh, they're stretching to expand and they're stretching to break again. I just, I want to support it, but a lot of times it's just happening too quickly. Yeah. It's kind of my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of unpacking that, um, and that Clayton. So let's, uh, let's go through one one by first and foremost, don't assume that those Farsia things are going to go through because they've got to go through the government. And I was reading a very good article on LinkedIn this morning saying, you know, yes, it's been announced by the government, but they've got those, um, delays have got to get through a very hostile Senate. So, um, that's not, that's not a given that those, um, those things will be delayed. So keep an eye on that space there. The right. second thing I'll say, and you're totally right about the mental health side of things. And, you know, we, we've seen the statistics this year of, um, of what, you know, you know, what um, this is actually doing to, um, to people and, you know, the, you know, yeah, the mental health consequences of that is, is really quite, it's, it's quite sad. And, I do think for a moment we do have to stop thinking like a profession and start talking about us again as people. And there's definitely that side of it as well. And, you know, I think talking to advisors, you know, dare I say it, the same conversations we probably have with our clients that it's more than just the money. It's, you know, it's that whole how is your whole life going so to speak yeah. like you know why, why be the the you know have 10 million bucks if you're miserable fine with your family when you can have you know a few hundred thousand you know be living the lifestyle going to the beach happy wife happy kids that kind of thing i think that conversation that's probably will form a bit of the conversations going forward when talking to advisors 
and particularly over the next 12 months because there is going to be a lot of rapid change. And in terms of that change itself, and I think I, that change, as you've rightly said, it is a good thing and it needs to happen. But you look at any change, there's going to be, I don't want to use the word casualties, but I can't think of another one off the top of my head, but there's going to be people yeah. that are caught up. Like I'm in Geelong, like we had Ford and Alcoa, two of our biggest industries in Geelong or biggest um, manufacturers in Geelong closed down two or three years ago. And that caused mass redundancies and a significant workforce who had been doing that for 30 years. Um, and, you know, that they've got to find new careers, new jobs, be reskilled, rechained and things like that. And that was, yeah, there was going to be a bit of, um, there were some big concerns for Geelong and how, what sort of impact that would have. But Geelong has got through it, you know, where, um, you're going strong as well. And I do believe the financial planning profession as a whole will certainly get through these changes and be and be better for it. There's definitely some big concerns um, and we've got to be very mindful what impact these changes have on individual circumstances. But um, at the end of the day, the change is going to come through. I don't think we'll stop the change, nor I, dare, I don't think we should stop the change either. But... Um, yeah, I think we've just got to be mindful, again, that we are talking about with people who've got retirements, families, jobs, and a very high levels of stress and anxiety about this. Um, you know, let's, let's just keep talking. Let's keep communicating about how we actually truly are going with this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, um, it's an interesting thing. Like, at XY, we've tried a couple of things to sort of create, I guess you could say private little communities for, Mm. to to get people together to discuss this sort of stuff. And then it didn't, it like, it didn't, it wasn't something that everyone, everyone wanted to be there to listen, I think, but, but I think a lot of people didn't want to publicly sort of write it down. Um, and so we're, we're a little bit lost in uh, what to do uh, in order to provide something um, because, yeah, there's, it, it's a tough time and, like I said, like, advisors really are resilient. It's just the, the type of personalities, you know, like it's such, a, it's such a unique personality where you have to be good with you have to be good with people and you have to be good with numbers and, yes. and sort of logical thought as well. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's an interesting type of person. And I think because we're good with people, I think there's a, there's a openness to be vulnerable, but everyone's uh, sort of not naive as well. So we want to be a little bit, a little bit protected. Um, one of the things that I've been thinking about is, uh, so when you catch an Uber or any ride share, there's a $1 fare fee that goes to a pool of money that uh, the government organised to pay to retiring taxi drivers because, mm. yeah, because sort of, you know, it's a, it's a very similar story um, yes, for a lot of these people. Similar. Yep. Yeah, and so... Uh, one one of the things that my mind goes to is um, whether we should be maybe skewing the conversation to start thinking about rather than fighting everything, what remedies could be could be could be put together from from the government um, to help with these advisors who you know especially like these A and P advisors, man. This is crazy where they woke up and they lost half their business valuation overnight. That's shocking. That's, that's tough. Um, and I guess that really boils down to what was the actual terms and conditions of that contract. If, and I, I don't know this, so I can't, I can't really comment on the specifics of it. But um, I think it's fair to say that four times value, book value, was extremely generous in this market. So I totally understand why AMP made the change. 
Now, whether they are legally able to make that change, that's a conversation. I know you've had um, someone from A&P on the podcast recently, so um, it's a completely conversation that I can't uh, really comment on. But um, I think the issue with what you just said there is, yeah, the whole concept of paying someone else, um, you know, setting up a fund for retiring financial planners, who's going to pay for it? That's my first mm. question. And ultimately, it will be the, the client. That's what who will pay for it. And there's part of the um, Royal Commission, there was, uh, you know, obviously the recommendation that, um, that advisors should be paying for remediation for clients, uh, for those who didn't have PI and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, which um, can cause a significant, um, you know, why should I or my clients pay? Because another advisor, whether deliberately or not, has stuffed up. Um, that's mm. um, you know, there's a lot of pushback on that one. And I guess, dare I say it, but if we're, you know, I would have thought that a good financial planner would have had a plan B in place. Like, like we see it as, you know, I, I see it as a financial planner where people say, you know, oh, my business is my retirement plan and, you know, you know my, my hardware company or my, you know, gift shop or whatever it might be is my retirement. My taxi licence was my uh, retirement plan. And I would think that should ring an alarm bell in every single financial planner going, oh, no, 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 that is definitely not right. Um what, um, you know, you need to diversify, you need to think about your super, owning your own home and having investments in your personal name, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I would hope that advisors would, who give that advice would do the same themselves. And, yeah, yeah I, I know I, I appreciate, yes, there's a lot of pressure and I know a lot of advisors, you know, and starting your own practice is one of the toughest things you can do, probably second half behind having children. It's, um, yeah, I think, yeah, maybe there is, um, yeah, it may be those who, you know, haven't prepared outside. Of it. I don't know. I don't know. It's, I'd be, yeah, I think there's a, there's got to be, you've got to have more value than, you know, your, your financial plan, your, your financial plan's got to be more than just your practice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I totally get what you're saying. It's yeah. kind of like. It was sort of staring everyone in the face for a couple of years. The concept mm. of the Royal Commission was coming around. And, yep. and uh, yeah, that, there was, there's definitely, you know, I guess in life there's definitely the responsibility is on the individual, mm. of course, to, yes. to, to really sort of, you know, make sure that they have plans and things like that. I guess, you know, when that doesn't happen, it's just in, no one, I guess in our community, we just don't want to see anyone. We don't, so we don't no, it's, no. it's a massive shame. But um, what, what I've really enjoyed sort of uh, chatting to you about and hearing your perception on is the idea that, and, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, but like, would you say you're pretty bullish about advice moving forward and you're pretty positive about where it's headed? Um, I'm cautiously bullish um there is definitely there's definitely a lot of reasons to be optimistic and i think those advisors particularly this new cohort of advisors i think like my xy advisor my fellow afa finalists and all that kind of stuff they're going to be very well positioned going forward especially if these changes take place i guess um what is concerning me going forward is the ability for everyday people to access financial advice. That part of it I'm very concerned about. And one of my biggest takeouts, I'll quote two sources here. So one of my biggest takeouts out of the recent AFA conference was, um, was when ASIC was quoted as saying, you know, financial advice, I'm paraphrasing here, but financial advisors, just like doctors and lawyers, are not going to be accessible to everyday Australians without government assistance or something along those lines. Um, that's a real concern for me because I'm, I'm passionate, as you know, I'm passionate about helping everyday people. That is concerned that our corporate regulator is saying 
you know, we don't want financial planning. We, no, I'm talking what we don't believe financial planning is accessible for everyday people, and we're okay with that. Secondly, it, the comment came out from the head of AMP, um, uh, Francisco De Ferrer. I hope he's his name right there. But um, and he said that um, only this week, as we're recording this, that um, that those everyday Australians earning say eighty grand a year should not and will not have a full-time financial advisor. And that's, that, that really uh, rocked me a bit, that people, someone of his influence would have, make that sort of comment because I think it's 100% false. And I think for me, um, we talk about robo-advice. Robo-advice is not the answer uh, because it, when things go wrong, people don't want to talk to a robot, they want to talk to a human. So I know that Even robot... when things go right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's exactly <laughs> right. So, um, so yeah, robo-advice is not the answer, but I do think that technology plays a huge part in terms of how we do things better and more efficiently and things like that. I know a lot of advisors say, you know, we're too process-focused these days, but the better processes we have, the better outcomes we can get for clients at a cheaper rate, and that ensures we can help everyday people. I'm a big believer uh, that, I said this to someone the other day, I think that James Cook had better technology discovering in Australia than some financial planners have in this day and age today. <laughs> um, it's shocking. Like, even like, um, it's always started. <laughs> the sexton. He's got the sexton. <laughs> <laughs> the telescope. Like, when I was, when I started my own practice, to give you a bit of background here, um, I did contract power planning in order to fund my bills and to get my practice going. Wow. And so, because I did that for four years. And some of the technology out there is, like, it's disgraceful. It genuinely (laughs) is. And I think... No, I know. (laughs) It's like, you know, I'm... A lot of it, you just go... Like, when I can do a plan, like a super and risk plan as a power planner like takes no more than six hours research to completion uh, with good software totally. with bad software you know that's an that's an eight i was taking 18 12 hours with some of these provide with these software providers and yeah. you just go you know and that's just a cost that's being passed on ultimately to the customer so yeah. if we get if we get actually get advisors firstly if we get the proper technology to advisors that's the first thing. So they can do their jobs in a much more both efficient and compliant matter. Secondly, I think compliance and technology should be working together a lot more. So, for example, when we when uh, take, for example, when you recommend insurance and super, you've got to show a 10-year graph, okay? That's what compliance mm-hmm. have said, to show the impact mm-hmm. that insurance premiums will have on your super balance. That's all good. Now, tell me how I can do that in 90 seconds. It takes me yeah. to, if that's going to take me half an hour, then that's a waste of time, and it's it's an addition or it's an additional cost to the customer. Um, now I, I know how to do that very quickly, so um, that's all good there. So um, yeah, so I think yeah, so the compliance and technology need to be starting working together in order to um, deliver better outcomes for clients, and also and just as a society, we expect it as well. Like you know, um, and I think. Oh, yeah. The, the change is occurring, even if I think of like a super, like super providers, they've been 20 years, we just talked about, had the lowest fee, the lowest fee, barefoot invested, you know, put you in host class because it's got the lowest fees and things like that. I would dare say, I think the tide's turning because it's less about fees and more about service. And when it's taking you 30 minutes to get an answer, answer on the phone, I don't care how cheap your super provider is, if it's taking you half an hour to pick up the phone, I won't recommend you. And I don't think my clients or clients or the public in general want to work with you. So no, that's, a, that's a really good point. Yeah. So I think that there's going to be pressure. There's a lot of pressure on licensees at the moment. There, that pressure is going to increase from a technology perspective. I can say that because, you know, I'm within focus and their technology, their platform plus is very, very good software. So oh, that's good to on. hear. Yeah, yeah, I'm very happy. And that's, again, having that background, um, that's, that's how I can deliver my services at the, at the price levels I can because I've got to have that 
background support, which makes a huge difference. So, um, but yeah, I think if you don't have that, and I'm, to be honest, I can only think of one other software provider that I would recommend as a, with my experience as a power planner and as an advisor, if you don't have that software support, then I'd be, and that technology support, you, you need to start putting pressure on your licensees because that is, that's just unacceptable these days. Actually, on that, just because you sound really uh, experienced in this, what, what is your tech stack? My what, sorry? Your tech stack? So what, what providers oh, tech, do you tech, yeah, 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 yep, yep, yep. So um, I use ChantWest for my super comparisons. I use Omnium for my insurance research. Um, I generally find those two best. Chant West is a bit, probably could use a graphics upgrade, but um, yeah, but uh, it's still very accurate software, which is good. All, all of this will come out in advisor ratings, won't it? So I just realised. So uh, I'll get all that information. So in terms of other tech, like I said, Platform Plus, which is in focus software, that does most of my back office stuff, um, which is good. And then outside of that, uh, Zoom, do all my uh, appointments remotely via Zoom. Calendly, so people can book in directly into my calendar by Calendly. Um, yep. I think that's it, just the usual Microsoft um, uh, applications and um, that's it really. Yeah, right. So can, can someone access the InFocus dealer group technology if they're not a part of Focus? In I Focus? don't believe so. Okay. Um, but you're, you're like, if, as someone who's used a lot of these programs, yeah. you're... you're it's definitely, yeah, okay, I, I will, yeah, well, I, I do put my practice on the line for it because, because um, I'm, if, yeah, if I didn't believe in it, I'd look elsewhere, but, um, yeah. Wow, so that's like a huge advantage for you, is it, in terms definitely. of dealing with oh, Definitely, definitely. Wow. And one of those things you don't realise until, again, doing some contracting for a few other firms and seeing the software that's out there, um, Oh yeah, it's it's such a huge advantage. But again, it it, it can be better, and you know I'll yep. be raising issues with um, within focus about how we can make this software even better. That's yep. that's drive for excellence. Yep. And I think we all should have. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. Um, I just recently finished up a twelve month consulting gig at Advisor Ratings that you briefly mentioned, right. which yep. was uh, essentially helping them create a product rather than consumers rating advisors, it's advisors rating products. And then yes. I believe that they're getting closer and closer to actually releasing the full, mm. um, the full usable software. Um, but one of the insights that we got mm. uh, was how low net promoter score all technologies were across yep. the board. I mean, out of all of the categories, tech was easily unanimously disdained but and and so it I, well, the one good thing that i guess all providers can hold dear is that none of them are sort of you know like worse than the rest sure it was it, I, I mean there probably is but like it the the difference in what advisors expected and yes. what was delivered was so below um, everything else. And, and I was sort of thinking about it for a long time afterwards. I was like, why do advisors hate tech so much? Because, you know, there's nothing that's come out of the Royal Commission that, was, that reflected badly um, on it. You know, like there wasn't some software provider out there that had made advisors look mm -hmm. bad. It, what, what did occur to me, though, was that because tech is such a static behemoth of mm. you know code but legislation and requirements and compliance are always uh active um and dynamic that the lag between what's expected and what's delivered is you know six months that in the interim advisors get themselves into trouble with their licensee or, or, or excuse me, whoever, yeah. because it's impossible really for, for tech to, um, to keep up with compliance, I guess, except for, and this is kind of interesting. I hadn't thought it through to this extent. Yeah. 
situation that you're in. So if the mm. licensee is running the software, mm. then technically any – does it work that any sort of new compliance – uh, updates are then rolled out in the software automatically. Is that how it works? I, I believe so. Yeah, yeah. That's a huge uh, advantage. Yeah, that I, yeah. That um, was, that's a huge advantage. Yeah, I think um, again, in focus, in, in my view, is uh, again a lot of credit. My business goes to them, and being big enough, they're big enough to scale, but small enough to still retain that kind of like family vibe, um, so to speak. So yeah. um, and not have that multi-level. Uh, well, both both the multi level of you know unnecessary management, but also yeah. the um, I suppose a lot of the legacy issues as well. And I suppose to to go back to your point you just raised and a very good one, the reason we're probably not looking forward as a, as an industry or these particularly these big funds, you know, the big five, and not looking forward as an industry because they're looking backwards and trying to fix all these errors and mistakes and process issues that have occurred in the past, they're driving with, you know, with the focus in the rear view mirror. And so, and that's probably, may have accelerated their decision to, you know, most of them have left or in the process of leaving. Um, yeah. That going forward is, um, it's going to be a real concern. And so, I mean, you know, going forward is not, has not been a priority. So, and again, you look at the tech. Again, we just look at the tech that we use on a daily basis on our, on our phones, and uh, you know, with your, even Google or Facebook, and what they can do. Again, we talked about what the information that Facebook's got. Why doesn't you know? You know, that's that information. We don't have that technology in financial planning at the moment. So, it's a real. Mm. Uh, it's it's an it's an opportunity for someone smarter than me, but um, it's definitely an opportunity there for someone to uh, potentially move in that area. Um, because again, outside of Platform Plus, there's only one that I would consider using. Um, the rest are, again, they're trying to fix up a 1990s car, which it's probably just easier to light a match, blow it up, and start again. Uh, look, coming from Nambucco heads, I'd suggest uh, just putting a spoiler on it. That that's a really good, uh, <laughs> really good start. Thinking out any 90s car, mate. Yeah. Thanks so much for coming on. Uh, that's really all right. enjoyed sort of having chat about, you know, wide varied topics. Mm. If there's an advisor out there that um, wants to sort of reach out and say hi, uh, what's the best way for someone to get in contact with you? Yeah, yeah. Uh, from an advisor perspective, hit me up on uh, LinkedIn um, or you can go to masteryourmoneynow.com.au. You can check out everything that I do um, from a, you know, particularly in that teachers and nurses space, also on YouTube, Facebook and Instagram. And, yeah, particularly... And just to extend on this point, like I know there are a lot of advisors who who feel like they deal with you deal with, you specialize in that you know that top level you know the you know that top one percent so to speak and don't feel that they can look after the everyday teachers and nurses so to speak. So if you do have clients who fit into that category and you feel like that you can't service them because they just don't fit your model, by all means hit me up. Let's have a chat about it and uh, see if there's something we can work out. Awesome, man. That's so cool. Uh, again, thanks so much for coming on. I uh, really appreciate it. And I will be seeing you in a couple of weeks in Geelong where we Looking come to that. for the first time. So, uh, mate, thanks for uh, on you, mate. <laughs> done and done. All right, mate. Cheers. Thank you very much, Clayton. Cheers, mate. Bye.